I am Anna Martin. I'm the program coordinator for the Water Resources Research Institute. Like I said, we have a very large group today and they're all still trickling in. So we're so happy that you guys could join us on this cloudy day to uh, talk about wetlands with some experts in the field. We um, are, this is our second have you been uh, in Zoom with that computer before? You have? I believe so. So everyone, um, again, as I was saying, my name is Anna, and this is our second session for uh, the material that you would have heard originally presented in March. So we're so happy you could be here. Um, just a few ground rules. If everyone would please mute your microphones. Uh, this will minimize any background noise while our presenters are presenting. Um, we've had a lot of questions about the recording of this website, and it is recording. It will be posted on our new virtual content page um, on the WRI conference site, and we're happy to shoot a link um, to you for that. It will take a day or two to get it posted, maybe a little bit longer because it will have closed captioning. So just be aware. And you are free to uh, access that whenever possible and share it um, with colleagues. We've had a lot of that done with the first session. So really happy to, to see that the material is getting out there to those who need it the most. Uh, once this session is over, you guys will be provided with an, a link to an evaluation. A few short questions. We'd love to hear your feedback. It helps us improve and bring you the topics that you want to hear the most. Um, so please feel free to do that. It'll take five minutes of your day, maybe, maybe five minutes. And I'm sure Carolina Wetlands would uh, appreciate hearing the feedback. And so as you may have noticed, this is a session all about wetlands. And we have a great sponsor on board today with uh, Carolina Wetlands Association. And so representing that group, we have the president, Rick Savage is on. And then moderating, we have the vice president, Kim Matthews, and she also represents RTI. Uh, so we have a couple of different relationships with these guys and we're just very happy that they are able to do this with us. Um, closed captioning is not free, so even though the Zoom feature is a free thing, um, every little bit helps. So the support is appreciated. And uh, just a brief shout out to our uh, continued series uh, sponsor, which is YSI and Xylem. If you joined us for the first event, you may have seen their name pop up. So without further ado, I am going to send it over to Kim Matthews and let her kick us off. So thank you so much, Kim. Great, thank you, Anna. I am gonna share my slides. So thanks for that great introduction. And so while I have all these people who are obviously interested in wetlands, before we get to our presentations, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to tell you a little more about the Carolina Wetlands Association and um, what we are celebrating this month, which is American Wetlands Month. So Carolina Wetlands Association is a non um, is a is a nonprofit. We're a science-based organization advocating for wetlands across North and South Carolina. And so one of way one of the ways we do that in celebration of American Wetland Month is to recognize wetland treasures across the two states. So this slide here represents this year's um, wetland treasures. And we, we normally would do in-person tours to all of our wetland treasure sites each May, but due to the limitations, we are doing um, virtual tours. So every Monday throughout May, we've posted virtual tours to each one of these sites on our website and on all of our social media accounts. So this year's was Brogdon Bottomlands, Botany Bay, Panther Town Valley, Bunch Arrowhead Preserve, and Pocosin Lakes. On our website, carolinawetlands.org, there's an interactive map where you can um, get information on all 25 of our wetland treasure sites, which are listed at the bottom of this slide. And we also have links to those virtual tour videos. Um, we have created PDF fact sheets, and there's also links 
um, to other organizations that have the have information about each of those sites. So we encourage you to go check out all of the information we have about about these wetland treasures and other wetland information. You can also sign up for our newsletter or follow us on our social media. So thank you for that time. And now we are going to go ahead and start with our presentations. This is going to be the order of presentations we'll go through today. Each um, presenter has about a 15 minute presentation and we'll follow that up with some question and answer time after each presenter. So Mike, while I introduce you, if you want to go ahead and take control and share your screen, you can do that. So our first presentation is from Dr. Mike Birchall. He is a professor at North Carolina State University's Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering. He works in the area of ecosystem restoration, constructed wetlands for stormwater and wastewater treatment, and other water quality protections. We'll take it away, Mike. I'm here. All right, thank you. Um, can everybody see my screen okay as a single slide? Okay, I see some, I see some uh, upturned thumbs, that's great. So um, good morning to everybody and thank you for joining us for this virtual session and uh, thank you to WRI and Carolina Wetlands Association for hosting. Uh, today I'd like to share with you a case study involving constructed wetlands for tertiary treatment of wastewater and this project is part of our team's ongoing quest to look for new ways or sometimes old ways that have been forgotten or ignored to improve water quality in a meaningful and cost-effective manner. Okay, I'm trying to advance my slide here. Come on. Come on. Did they? I'm not seeing it. Because I set it up immediately before I'm done. How do you think I'm supposed to do it? Oh, person to your left right there. Okay. Let me go back out and get it cranked up again. Now we lay down for general. Just a reminder for everybody else to please mute your line. Oh, here we go. All right. Sometimes it does that. I don't know why. All right. So, you know, most of you in this session, I bet you've dedicated uh, a significant portion of your career to uh, protect water quality in North Carolina. And some of you probably on the, in this session uh, are working towards planning to do that. Um, in particular, trying to figure out ways to achieve the reduction goal of 30% in place for um, new, the Noose and the Tar Pam uh, watersheds. So, you know, we have, um, we've done a good job at moving toward those efforts. Pro we've made some progress there. Uh, efforts have reduced nitrogen loads in some, but not many, you know, in some areas, but, but many of the reductions have really kind of leveled out. And so that makes me wonder if there are additional sources of nitrogen entering the watershed that are unaccounted for, uh, perhaps from places like smaller wastewater facilities. And, um, you know, with any project, whether or not it would be something that you're working on around the house or a larger project, it seems like it's easy to make a lot of progress early on and, and, and kind of quickly, but achieving that last bit of perfection takes up some additional thought and effort. So I'd like to talk to you uh, about surface flow constructed wetlands for nitrogen removal. Uh, this is a technology that's been around for quite some time. It's an excellent example of ecological engineering. And uh, the wetland that you're trying to recreate here is most, uh, most similar to um, natural emergent macrophyte wetlands. Well, they have high plant and microbial activity, abundant carbon sources, uh, and both aerobic and, and in particular anaerobic zones that begin near the soil and water interface that really promotes denitrification, which is the removal of nitrate 
uh, from the waste stream. Wetlands also can remove some ammonium, as you'll see, but um, the, the really, the, the, the backbone of how wetlands work is really in removing nitrate forms of nitrogen through denitrification. Uh, it's a great example of ecological engineering, primarily because it uses natural energy sources, um, low fossil fuel inputs, and it's generally low maintenance and cost effective. But low maintenance does not mean no maintenance, as you'll see uh, as part of this presentation moving forward. So if constructed wetlands are so great for nitrogen removal, you, one would think there would be numerous in North Carolina. Well, they're really not. Um, a survey we conducted a few years ago revealed only a handful of constructed wetlands for wastewater treatment in North Carolina. And that's really a lot less than other states like Florida and California, despite the fact we have a great climate for them to be really efficient. Um, of note uh, on the right side there, if you notice the year built, most of these wetlands are now 20 and 25 years old. Uh, and so they're getting a little bit older and they're getting outside of what you can find in literature for what you should do with a wetland that, that are these old. And also the data on their performance is extremely limited. So we've got these wetlands out there. We think maybe they're doing a good job, but we're not really sure because we don't have a lot of data on them. So during this time, this same time period, late, you know, mid, mid 90s till now, uh, there's been dozens upon dozens of constructed wetlands for stormwater treatment that have been constructed. And they've, and they've been a really important part of achieving stormwater compliance. But if you look at stormwater wetlands versus constructed wetlands, uh, stormwater wetlands are gonna be event based. They generally have a lot um, less concentrated nitrogen entering them uh, than say if you put a uh, treatment wetland right next to a package plant, which may have as much as 10 to 20 milligrams per liter nitrogen coming out all day, every day. If you compare a flow amount of to, you know, the, the flows that you would get with an event-based stormwater wetland versus the treatment wetland, you can come up with a mass. And if you use kind of a, um, a pretty average removal rate uh, for treatment wetlands, you can see that over the course of a year, one treatment wetland has the potential to remove 30 times the amount of nitrogen per year when compared to the same size stormwater wetland. So um, it really begs the question that, you know, if you can build one of these storm of these uh, treatment wetlands right downstream with something that you know has a concentrated uh, amount of nitrogen, um, you can usually build these things, and if, if they are the equivalent nitrogen removal of 30 stormwater wetlands, why aren't we building more of these? They, they could also be a lot cheaper built in a rural environment versus an urban environment that you would find your stormwater wetlands. So, um, so we were really curious to see why these constructed wetlands for wastewater treatment really have not been embraced fully. So we set out to study one of these sites and hoping to increase the visibility of these wetlands and show the potential of constructed wetlands to improve surface water quality and maybe resulting in the increased adoption, particularly by small towns that could, and all of this could really, you know, help move that needle a little bit further in reducing nitrogen loads in our watershed. So we went up to one of those uh, five uh, wetlands that I noted earlier up in uh, Walnut Cove, North Carolina. Now, this was a pretty innovative system at the time. Um, it took a lagoon system and added several components, including a, 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 a constructed wetland to help make, meet their treatment um, goals rather than put a mechanical, larger, more expensive mechanical plan in there. And so from the wetland standpoint, um, there were two parallel cells about 1200 feet long by 60 foot wide, um, a little under two hectares that received about half a million gallons per day of uh, wastewater that had been pre-treated and had a hydraulic retention rate of about four days. Now at Walnut Cove, the state said that their permit needed to be 10 milligrams per liter for nitrogen and 30 milligrams per liter for both total suspended solids and BOD.
So this is how the wastewater treatment plant was supposed to form. Basically, the lagoon, the, from a nitrogen standpoint, this was the strategy. So the water, wastewater came in that was pretty high in ammonium and virtually no nitrate in it. And, it's, and it's, it was aerated. Uh, mineralization and nitri uh, nitrification would reduce the amount, the concentration of ammonium and increase the, the concentration of nitrate. The ammonium rate in um, uh, the duckweed uh, raceway, which was uh, supposed to be built for the duckweed to grow on this and be harvested, would remove a little bit more of the ammonium, but when the water entered the wetland cells, it would be primarily in the form of nitrate, at which point denitrification in the wetlands would help reduce that nitrate down to some pretty low levels before it exited the plant. So our goal was, um, with the help of WRI, was to really go there and um, study out what we thought was perhaps a high performing wetland and help develop design standards and build support for expanded use of wetlands to combat nitrogen loads to watersheds in rural North Carolina. So we set up an experiment. You'll hear a little bit more about that uh, later. Uh, so we started checking the water that was coming into the wetlands and through the wetlands and at the effluent of the wetlands, uh, measuring a whole host of, of different things from uh, hydraulics to water quality um, to the weather there. And what we quickly realized is that the, believe it or not, the ammonium in the water coming out of the wetlands many times during the year was actually higher than was what was going in. So that was initially a pretty baffling thing to discover. Uh, in addition, the, the high levels of nitrate that we expected to be coming into the wetlands through pretreatment was not there. And so the wastewater, the nitrogen forms in the wastewater was predominantly ammonium. Now, it should be noted that the the, um, the, the town was not really aware of this because their monitoring only required that they monitored at the effluent of the wetland. So they did, not, they did not have a true picture of how the nitrogen was moving as it was going through uh, the entire treatment. So we started looking at the numbers and yep, um, you know, even, you know, as, as recently as fall of 2018, we're still seeing very low concentrations of nitrate. The amount of uh, nitrogen that's coming in um, into the wetland was about eight. It's going out at about eight. Uh, and so there's really no, um, really no treatment of the nitrogen going through this wastewater treatment well. And when my graduate student Brock that, you, uh, that you'll hear from in a few minutes really started digging into some of the data that was available from the MPDES permit effluent, you could see that this trend of monthly ammonium concentrations has been steadily going up over time. And if you note, know, it's still below this 10 milligram per liter um, limit, but it's a slow bleed toward um, the town actually starting to come in to you know, be, have the potential to have some permit violation issues. Not to mention that, you know, there's four times more nitrogen leaving this wastewater treatment plant than it was um, you know, 10 years ago. So what essentially was going on is that the ammonium was staying, was reduced a little bit in the primary lagoons, but was not, not changed very much going through uh, the, uh, the wetlands. So as Brock started doing his work there, we started, we, we saw some other early symptoms of poor performance. Um, there was a lot of detritus that actually would get stuck in our outlets and was making its way into the chlorinator, dechlorinator. Uh, and I, I don't know how many calories that guy has burned in removing that stuff to keep from clogging out the wetlands, but it was an everyday occurrence. And it was really, um, really um, affecting the treatment performance in the chlorinator and dechlorinator. So it was, he described it as like a glacier of muck that seemed to be moving through the system. Now remember, this system is 25 years old. And we also started seeing shallow water moving through these areas 
uh, that also looked like it was short circuiting. What short circuiting means is that when the wastewater gets in the wetland, it's not spending as much time in the wetlands or is not, it's also not being distributed across the wetland as much as you would think. And so the wetland's not able to uh, treat the water as it was intended. So we did some rotavine dye tracer studies uh, and the aerial images were really striking. You can really pick out the short circuiting uh, through the cells here um, once you drop the dye in there to see that only a small portion of the wetland uh, is actually being used, the, the water is, is only using a, a small section of the wetland. And so that means that the water was not staying in the wetland as long as it was designed and the entirety of the surface area was not being used for treatment anymore. This was all likely because it was a 25 year old wetland uh, that had filled up with detritus. In fact, when we, um, when we collected the data, uh, we would measure the, the breakthrough of the dye by collecting automated samples at the outlet. You can see that the majority of the dye concentration would pass through the wetland in less than a day. So the wetlands could not provide treatment they were designed for under these conditions. So no wonder we were starting to see some of those trends in ammonium go up. Here's a photograph when you got in there and dug around, you can see that there was over a foot of this detritus that has built up over time and the wetland plants were like growing on top of it. And so you've got this short circuiting, this poor mixing, not to mention the, uh, an internal source of ammonium that uh, could be formed in there as um, the detritus slowly broke down with time. And we started, uh, when we were going and visiting other wetlands, we were seeing similar issues observed at Aurora and at Caledonia Prison. So these things are getting older and it was gonna make it pretty difficult for us to endorse wetlands uh, when the ones out there might be currently having some problems. So we were lucky enough to get a community collaboration research grant uh, through North Carolina Sea Grant and, and WRI and went out there and removed the detritus to try to breathe new life into one of the cells, document the, the process, and then test the effect on water quality, oxygen distribution, and internal hydraulics of, for the system. So essentially, we were trying to reduce these um, systems from one that had a shorter hydraulic retention time and a high internal source of ammonium to longer retention time and lower internal sources of ammonium. Um, once we were able to reestablish the, the vegetation in there that would increase some assimilation, help couple denitrification and nitrification, uh, maintain our pH and provide biofilm attachment on the plant sites. So the clean out plan included uh, taking one of the cells out, letting it dry out um, in May, uh, and then taking an excavator with a 60 foot boom and work from uh, downstream to upstream, pull the detritus back up on the, on the bank um, and allow that to dewater and stabilize. Leave about four to six inches in the bottom of the cell. And then as we were going along, we were, we were scooping out clumps of existing cattail and replanting it as we go on four foot spacings there to, to revegetate the cell pretty quickly. And it ended up being about a five day process. A few pictures of the before and after of the cell one, you can see that there was not much vegetation growing in here because it was, it was the water, it stayed uh, backed up in these areas a lot of times. A little bit of fringing cattails, but you can see afterwards uh, a lot of uh, the detritus has been moved out and you can see the space of our cattail clumps there. And this big long L here is the cell that we cleaned out compared to the inner cell that we did. This photograph was taken in the fall and you can see that wetland cell one with the detritus removed and then replanted looks much more like the type of wetland that was initially designed uh, in comparison for cell two, which uh, ended up being our control to try to see the effect of, of what the uh, detritus removal will actually have. 
So how did it work? Well, you're going to find out some of the preliminary um, um, results that we had when Brock um, does his presentation. We're going to be look, we looked at water quality flow and other environmental conditions, did some additional tracer studies. Uh, we're looking at methods of aeration upstream of the wetland to increase nitrification and create more nitrate. And we've been doing some outreach and training, in particular, the lessons that we've learned in um, cleaning out this wetland are probably going to be applied to another wetland at Caledonia State Prison. So overall, this is my last slide, the, the, the project impacts, we, we really want to distribute, uh, demonstrate that constructed wetlands are technology that should be added back to the toolbox uh, for water quality improvement, particularly for rural towns in need of additional nitrogen treatment to, re to meet permits. It's a low cost technology that can be efficient when operated correctly. Uh, could be for rural towns in need of treatment plan expansions um, if they are expecting new populations. And then this idea of tertiary treatment of wastewater from package plants that export excess and often unaccounted nitrate. Um, they're meeting their ammonium distribution or, or um, um, discharge limits, but they're still uh, pumping out a lot of nitrate, which isn't under permit. Basically discharge this, this water from package plants to constructed wetlands and obviously, you know, um, reduce and send less uh, nitrogen into our local surface waters. So with that, uh, I guess I can pause for questions. Please follow the, the work that we're doing on at NC State Wetland. If you've got any questions about wetlands or anything about water quality, please contact me at my email address. So that does it, thank you. Great, thanks Mike. We do have a handful of questions that were submitted on the chat. And just a reminder that Brock's presentation is going to be the second part of this, so talking, focusing on the, the tritis removal. So there'll be more details on that part. So one of the first questions, um, did you monitor the microbial flora? Much of the uh, nitrogen breakdown happens at that microbial level and that will affect the nutrient uptake? Great question. That is something that we have done and is currently uh, being analyzed. Um, we have a, a microbiologist on our faculty that is helping us work on that. And we have some initial um, information on the, the different um, bacteria uh, groups in, in the lagoon versus the wetland uh, versus the oxidation trench. And I can't tell you how much this means necessarily for nitrogen treatment, but you can see those groups change as you go through um, the wetland, uh, go through the treatment plant. And that's something that we're going to focus in more um, as, as that uh, information becomes available. Good question. Did um, the work that was done to remove the detritus, did you require a permit from the Corps of Engineers? No, uh, the Corps of Engineers doesn't oversee these types of constructed wetlands. Um, this would be managed by DEQ. Uh, and since we didn't take the detritus off uh, the property and allowed it to dewater back into the wetlands and revegetated, a permit wasn't required. That does answer another question that said, what did you do with the, de the detritus and muck you removed? So it was all dewatered? And yeah, removed. basically, we, I'm sorry I didn't make that more clear, but when the excavator grabbed the detritus, we laid it on the bank. We left the, uh, the cattails that were kind of fringing all of the wetlands, and we used that almost as kind of a coarse filter to allow that to kind of slide back in there and dewater, and then it dried out, compressed, and revegetated right there on the bank. So what about like long-term, um, there was a question about, you know, wastewater treatment plan operator and municipality wanting to maybe event fill these in at the end of their lifespan. Would they, would that, they wouldn't have to do that with the mitigation requirement or a nationwide permit. Do you know what would be the long-term implications of the treatment wetlands and what they, what would happen at the end? Now, the, these type of wetlands don't, 
that when, when you construct a wetland for wastewater treatment, it is not like um, another wetland that falls under the, the Corps' guidance. So it's part of a wastewater treatment thing. And so it's not, it's not protected uh, like natural and restored wetlands are. And what about the discharges then, if there's any contaminants that are coming out of the treatment plant? Would that be potential for remediation obligation under like a CERCLA or RICRA? I'm sorry, I don't really understand that question. If the wastewater treatment discharges has some contaminants that may not, not nitrogen, but maybe some others like emergent, emerging contaminants or um, other listed, um, contaminants, what would be, would that be considered a remediation under CERCLA or RICRA, like a hazardous waste site? Um, this, I mean, this is, this would fall under the guidance of just like any other um, wastewater treatment plant in North Carolina. And they're, they're not necessarily held to meeting permit regulations for those types of emerging contaminants. So this one is no different. And I'm gonna ask one more question before we go on to Brock. And then I think, cause I think Brock will get to some of these other questions that are being asked. Um, why wait 20, 25 years for foreign maintenance? Can't you be doing more routine uh, maintenance to preserve better treatment if you do the maintenance on a regular basis? That is the number one type of point that we would like to make out of this research. Um, unfortunately, back in the 90s when these were being built, there wasn't a lot of maintenance guidance. It was a lot of people thought these were literally build them and walk away and they'll take care of themselves. I talked to one of the major authors of the Bible, if you will, of treatment wetlands, and he's got about two pages on maintenance. When I was telling him about what we were doing here, he said that, that these, th this, this could be a chapter in his new book because there was not enough done for, for giving maintenance guidance. And you're exactly right. Um, we would recommend that different sections uh, be cleaned out every year, kind of as an ongoing process so you don't have to spend all the money in one year and you get all the benefits of cleaning these things out from year to year. Uh, so it should be an ongoing process and these should be, as, as Brock will tell you, uh, these should be designed and maintenance documents should be, uh, should make these very clear. And, and I, I really think the lack of maintenance documentation is one of the things that really has held back this technology um, from being more wide, widely accepted in North Carolina because of all of the uncertainty about how these things are gonna work when they get older. Great, Great. thanks Mike. We're gonna end the questions right now because we're gonna go on to Brock's presentation. Mike, if you wanna look at some of those questions in the chat during Brock's presentation, maybe you can come back and help answer those at the end. Okay. So Brock, if you want to pull up your presentation while I give a little introduction to you. So Brock is a doctoral student of Dr. Birchall at NC State University, Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering, and he is studying, as we're going to hear more about, the performance of constructed wetlands for tertiary treatment of wastewater. So go ahead, Brock, take it away. All right, is this, am I working? Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks for that introduction. Um, my presentation here will be kind of a part two to what Dr. Birchall just presented. Um, he's also a co-author on this presentation as well as Dr. Jack Kirky Fox. And so for this presentation, what you just heard in Dr. Birchall's presentation was at our study site, the Walnut Cove Wastewater Treatment Plant is one of three municipal wastewater treatment plants that uses these free water surface constructed wetlands for biological nutrient removal. And this site was uh, put online in 1996. And lately we have seen a general decrease in performance at the site while flow at the site um, stayed relatively the same, which indicates there was some problems internally at the site. And one way to try to remediate that has been to um, and to improve treatment performance in those wetlands was to rejuvenate the wetland cell one 
while leaving that second Welland cell in its original state as a reference or control. And then for my presentation, I kind of want to get more into the in-depth look at kind of the short-term impacts and what we've seen so far um, in terms of wetland performance since that rejuvenation. So to start here is uh, Walnut Cove again, that cell one is the outside cell, while well, cell two kind of makes that backwards S internally. Uh, both cells have the same surface area of 0.7 hectares, the same aspect ratio, and the same morphology. They're a flat basin. They're supposed to have about 10 inches of uh, water depth in them. And so for a monitor- I'm sorry to interrupt you, but could you perhaps speak a little louder? Um, there was, just, can you just speak a little, a little louder would be great. Is this better? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Sounds good. Um, so uh, our sampling stations, we uh, placed those that are located on the set on the picture with the white dots. Um, those were installed at the inlet splitter box as well as at the outlet of each wetland. These sampling stations monitored flow using state by measuring stage and using a sharp crested weir equation. Um, these also had automatic samplers, which you can see in that bottom left picture. And those took daily water quality samples, which were then composited into weekly samples for analysis. And in addition to these composite samples, we also took grab samples for every site visit. We took those at the inlet midpoints, which are those red dots and outlet. And that allowed us to get longitudinal profiles of nitrogen species through the wetlands as well. Um, in addition to that, we also took water quality parameters and there was an on-site weather station installed and that was installed where that blue star is on the map. But on top of our water quality and flow measurements, we also did tracer tests to determine the internal hydraulics. Uh, we used rhodamine dye as our end tracer. Uh, two sets of tracer tests were done in each cell prior to rejuvenation, and then since rejuvenation, we've done three sets. And these provide the basis for our hydraulic performance quantification. And getting back into Dr. Birchall's presentation, um, just to kind of rehash this one more time, so some of the main factors for reduced treatment in these wetlands was number one was significant detritus accumulation. It had limited the volumetric efficiency down to 25% of the design volume. It dropped the mean residence time down to about one day. Uh, the water column was about four inches instead of 10. Um, to the point about uh, microbial processes, it had started, the flow was now moving around vegetation in tight channels instead of through vegetation. So that limited microbial attachment sites. And then finally, all this detritus in the cell likely was forming an internal source of ammonia through mineralization. And then the second main factor was then that that inlet total nitrogen concentration was dominated by ammonia. About 70% of the inlet total nitrogen was in the form of ammonia. And as a result to have effective total nitrogen removal, we needed both assimilation for temporary removal and storage, and that was limited by the sparse vegetation, short residence time. And then for complete removal, you need paired nitrification, denitrification, which was then limited by inadequate biofilm attachment sites through the cells, as well as then, again, to come back to it, that very short residence time. So this should take us to kind of the, uh, where Dr. Birchall kind of ended. We performed this wetland rejuvenation um, in late April. You can see these are similar pictures to maybe what you just saw, but the cell was brought back online at half capacity after rejuvenation in mid-May, and then brought back to full capacity in mid-August 2019. So to get into the rejuvenation goals specifically, these are kind of our immediate goals were one, to improve wetland hydraulic performance, and then two was to reestablish that vegetation throughout the cell. This would hopefully then increase our assimilation potential in the cell. Uh, shading by those cattails would limit algal blooms in the cell and help maintain low pHs, or neutral pHs, I guess. And then uh, 
water moving through the vegetation instead of around it would allow those vegetation stems to provide uh, microbial attachment sites. So now getting into our post rejuvenation hydraulics. And this is at the start of the tracer test in cell one. The picture on the left is at the start of a tracer test before rejuvenation. And then the picture on the right is at the start of a tracer test after rejuvenation. And it was immediately clear that now the cell, instead of just moving through a central channel, was now spreading out over the entire width of the cell and would hopefully move through the entire cell using up that whole surface area. To get further into our actual tracer test results, we have our residence time distributions here. Um, on the x-axis is days since the tracer was injected. The vertical lines on these charts, the T-nom is the nominal residence time or the design residence time. And that is assuming the cell has 100% volumetric efficiency as well as ideal plug flow hydraulics. While contrast that with the tau vertical line, which is the mean residence time that was derived from our actual tracer tests. And on the left, you can see cell one with the detritus removed you have a mean residence time that's now closer to the design residence time, as well as that mean residence time is now more along the line of three days instead of one day. And you can see that cell two without any change still has that mean residence time of about one day. So just getting into um, more quantification of this performance, we looked at three Tracer or hydraulic indices with a hydraulic indice for the hydraulic efficiency for short circuiting and also for mixing. I'm not going to get into the values in this table in this presentation, but just know that these values are used um, to qualitatively rank wetland treatment cell performance, and that using these values, we were able to determine that before rejuvenation, both wetland cells were hydraulically compromised while since rejuvenation, cell one, the rejuvenated cell is now uh, ranked as satisfactory where cell two is still in that compromised or poor performance ranking. So that just um, goes to show that so far we've accomplished our first goal. Our residence time is now near three days and we are meeting, um, we're having at least satisfactory hydraulic performance in that rejuvenated cell. And then getting uh, into our second goal, which is the rejuvenation is the vegetation coverage. Uh, Dr. Birchall already kind of talked about this, but here's a photo of the cell in the fall of 2019. And you can see that the outside cell is fully vegetated with both cattails and duckweed in areas that there aren't cattails where um, well in cell two, which is kind of in, in the back there, it still has those large open water areas. And then looking kind of down the runway in these cells. This is from January of 2020. You can see that the cell with detritus removed still is fully vegetated across the cell and down the length of the cell where cell two still has that vegetation just um, along the edge. I also felt like I should probably point out that if you get any good uh, photographer, I did manage to capture myself in both of these images. <laughs> But that just goes, um, those go to show that you know, we've established the second goal as well, which is reestablishing that vegetation. And in addition to that, we've actually uh, observed at the site biofilm growth on the portion of the cattail stems that are within the water column. So that is um, good as well. Getting more into the water quality aspect of things. The inlet uh, speciation is still the same. It's still dominated by ammonia. You can see ammonia is 5.3 compared to total nitrogen of 7.3. Um, but what I do want to bring your attention to from this is the fact that wetland cell one in that bottom right table is now showing a concentration reduction of 23 percent for total nitrogen removal where areas that wetland two is now showing a negative four percent. Um, concentration reduction through the cell. 
but these are just mean values over the um, course from May to January since rejuvenation. And getting into actually what we've seen kind of month to month, uh, this is a chart of mean monthly total nitrogen concentrations with influent total nitrogen in black, the cell one effluent in red, and the cell two effluent in blue. Uh, the gray bar shows when rejuvenation occurred. And I want to point out that since that rejuvenation, so to the right of the gray bar, the red line has been lower than the blue line for every single month since rejuvenation. But um, in addition to that, there are two occurrences that I also wanted to point out. One is this immediate um, major reduction in total nitrogen in cell one right after rejuvenation. And then second is this, we're starting to see improved performance um, now moving into January, kind of at the um, end of our sampling so far. So what is, what is kind of causing these within our monitoring? To investigate these, I wanted to show you the longitudinal data for both nitrate concentration on the left there and ammonia concentration. The light blue lines are the treatment cell, where the dark blue lines are the uh, control cell that wasn't rejuvenated. And getting into that first case, that immediate team removal, it appeared that there was not due to nitrification production necessarily, but just a massive amount of assimilation that was occurring there in the spring of 2019 through the cell. And that brings us to what we saw. And it looked like this was actually occurring due to kind of an algal bloom within that cell. Uh, right after rejuvenation and replanting, the cell was kind of opened up and allowed abundant sunlight into the cell. And it basically had turned, we don't have chlorophyll A data from that time, but the water was Mountain Dew green. So I'm guessing that chlorophyll A was pretty high. Um, however, as the vegetation, the cattails and duckweed grew, it started to shade the cell and likely limited the algal blooms that could occur in the cell. And, um, and then moving into that, that second case, though, was that increased total nitrogen removal this winter. And this is what we're actually getting pretty excited about. We, for the first time, we're seeing a fair amount of nitrate production paired with ammonia removal. Um, and this is uh, really key for that complete, or that paired nitrification denitrification reaction. So to kind of sum up, the short-term monitoring, we had an initial algal bloom that likely led to an immediate reduction of ammonia. However, this was unlikely to be a long-term phenomenon, and it was just kind of caused by that opening up of the cell. Um, that being said, now this new improved nitrogen removal performance uh, that we saw this winter that correlated to that nitrate production, that is highly, uh, makes us pretty happy and gives us hope that we're going to see improved nitrification, denitrification through the cell and an overall improved total nitrogen performance in 2020. That being said, sampling was halted in March. Um, so I don't have any new data to share after that. We don't really know if it's still happening or not. And that's where when we can get back out there and keep sampling. It's going to be critical to know uh, if that paired nitrification, denitrification is likely still happening. And then uh, to kind of bring it all together for uh, the loadings that we've seen at the site, since rejuvenation in May, cell one removed 136 kilograms of total nitrogen, where cell two, the non-rejuvenated cell, exported about 18 kilograms of total nitrogen. And I feel like this really shows, one, the impact that rejuvenation has had on nitrogen removal through the cell, um, while at the same time it also shows that you know, these cells that are sparsely vegetated, filled with detritus, and hydraulically compromised are going to struggle to provide adequate performance. So just moving a little bit forward, we are going to continue to try to increase nitrate going into the cell. We're going to try to do that through increased aeration. We actually had a senior design project this year that worked to establish, to install aerators in that upstream oxidation ditch and they looked at microcosms of growth media that could possibly be put into those oxidation ditches. Um, along with that, in our laboratory, we want to do mesocosm studies to quantify 
uh, better quantify the impacts of detritus over time. And uh, similar to the comment that was made at the end of Dr. Birchall's presentation, we want to start investigating strategies for uh, sectional, possibly like sectional removal over time of detritus to um, provide maintenance over time to reduce the need for this grand scale rejuvenation. So in conclusion, you know, at Walnut Cove, we saw that our immediate wetland rejuvenation goals have been met. And along with that, that our total nitrogen removal in cell one has been promising so far, um, but that these results were obtained during startup period and that further long-term data will help and begin to reflect what will happen and, like, in terms of steady state conditions. And then just generally for all constructed wetlands, you know, over time, this accumulation of detritus will lead to hydraulic inefficiencies and compromised treatment performance. And that we should begin to look at uh, improving constructed wetland lifespan by designing these systems with this future maintenance in mind, whether it be this vet rejuvenation or uh, harvest, intermediate harvesting. And uh, I'll just finish on some broader impacts. We're hoping that this study will provide an additional resource for site managers that have constructed wetlands that need to operate them on site. And finally, hopefully this shows that constructed wetlands could offer a relatively inexpensive and long lasting additional nitrogen removal. I mean, for our study, this is the, you know, a one time to try this clean out and vegetation management and a 25 year old wetland still provided 15% total nitrogen reduction. So these things might have a longer lifespan than we think with rejuvenation. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Fred Summers, the Walnut Cove Public Works, uh, Jack Kirky Fox, Tommy, Jonathan, and Jerry for helping me out in the field. Um, there's been some hot, rough days out there, but we've made it through. And I'd like to thank our, our funding providers as well. Okay, thanks Brock. We have about three minutes for some questions and Mike's been doing a good job of responding to some of them, but there was this earlier question, you may have mentioned it, what um, was the size of Walnut Cove? What's the size of the community that the wet, wetlands treating? It is about 1,800 people. So it's a, it's a minor wastewater treatment plant. There's some questions about um, wildlife that have been maybe using the wetland treatment site. Did, um, was any, I guess, did you observe or do any type of studies on the birds or amphibians that may have been using the wetlands? We haven't done a study on it, but I've seen both great blue herons out there and a few green herons. Um, typically, like every two weeks when I'm out of the site, there is a bird watcher out there. Um, I think there's a website you can go to to see what has been observed at the site. I haven't actually um, looked into that in a while, but that's the extent. And I guess in during the work that you did, did you have to take any special precautions for protection of animals? or the wildlife that would be at the site? I, I, can, I can answer that, Brock, if you want me to. Yeah, go ahead. So there are a lot of turtles that, that reside in the wetlands. And we, we feel pretty strongly that the turtles, as we were making our way down there, the, 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 the turtles did have the ability to go from cell one to cell two. And so uh, we, we salvaged what we could and what we saw in there. Um, but they did have that mass exodus option to them, for them. Here's a good question. If you were going to build a wetland today, would you use the similar design or would you change something with the design? I think at least on my end, while the, the 17 to one aspect ratio can lead to clogging that we saw a little bit more easily. I think if you put in these uh, more intensive maintenance procedures, um, this is that aspect ratio works better for the actual internal hydraulics of the system. So I think the design is actually really good. It's, it's probably the maintenance that would need to be improved. And when the site was built, what was the vegetation that was planted in the site? It looks like all cattails. Was that and I guess, is there any thought to other types of plants that could be used for treatment? 
Cattails, cattails and bulrush are your two heavy hitters for wastewater treatment wetlands because they can stand um, the uh, constant one foot inundation and uh, they can handle high pollutant loads. Okay. There are quite a few more questions in, but I think we need to move on to our next speaker. We're at 11.30. Um, so I do want to give an opportunity. So thank you, Brock. You got some nice applause. And there are, like I said, we can we can give you the questions and we can try to follow up with them later um, after the session. All right. So our next speaker is Melinda Martinez. If you would like to go ahead and start your presentation while we are while I do your introduction. So Melinda Martinez is working towards her doctorate in forestry with a minor in remote sensing, also at North Carolina State University, but in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Her work is focused on determining the early warning signs of the transition from forest to marsh. Hi. So um, Melinda, we see um, the presentation view and not the slide view. Yeah, we see oh, the notes. Uh, how do I change that? So Melinda, I think if you go back to where you just were and then hit at the top the view slideshow. Right here. Mm -hmm. Down at the bottom, yes, that icon there. Yep. Yeah, I think that's what I had previously shown. Can you still see the? Uh -huh. And then at the very top next to in show, it's either going to be use slideshow or swap displays on the left hand side of your screen there. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, keep going to the left, use slideshow, swap displays. We can see it at the very top of your screen next to intro. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. There you That's go. True. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Sorry about that. No worries. Obviously, you can, I'm assuming you can hear me very clearly. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to talk about uh, one of my chapters on my dissertation, uh, which focuses on greenhouse gas emissions from standing dead trees in coastal forested wetlands. Uh, and my advisor at NC State is Marcelo Ordon. Uh, so the greenhouse gases that I am focusing on are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, which are important um, due to their ability to absorb energy. And although methane and nitrous oxide are much lower in atmospheric concentrations, um, it is important to understand their pathways and emissions because they are more potent than CO2. So methane is about 40 times more potent, uh, while nitrous oxide is about 300 times more potent. And although wetlands occupy, um, as many of you know, a small portion of the globe, they do contribute significantly to the global carbon cycling through carbon sequestration and also methane emissions. And so they contribute as much as 20 to 30 percent of the global methane emissions. And so it's a lot. And more recently, studies have focused on um, tree stems as sources of greenhouse gases that could provide more insight in understanding the global carbon cycle and nitrous oxide emissions. So many freshwater forested wetlands um, across the southeastern US are rapidly transitioning from forest to marsh due to a combination of saltwater intrusion which can be uh, drought induced or uh, caused by storm surges or sometimes wind tides. Um, and a second disturbance is also increased, more increasing flooding events. And as forested wetlands transition to marshes, there are many standing dead trees that are left behind, which many people refer to them as ghost forests. So in forested wetlands, there are various pathways greenhouse gases can take to be emitted uh, from the soils to the atmosphere. And methanogenesis, which is the production of methane, occurs in soils 
because of anaerobic conditions from high water levels and soil saturation. And nitrous oxide can be produced in the soils when um, nitrification and denitrification is incomplete. And so greenhouse gases can be emitted directly to the atmosphere by either diffusion or ebullition, which is just bubbling. And so this is much higher concentrations. Um, and this happens through the water column, the soil and water column. But they can also be transported through a tree stem. And so this can happen in live and dead trees. And so in live trees, this occurs because of the movement of uh, water up the tree stems, which can also bring up greenhouse gases up the tree stem. And in dead trees, um, a lot of this water is flushed out. And so um, this leaves a lot of open cells allowing greenhouse gases from the soils to move up the, the tree stems due to pressure differences. And so in a way, these standing dead trees are acting as straws for greenhouse gases produced in the soils and then be, are being emitted to the atmosphere. So here in North Carolina, there are many freshwater forested wetlands that are transitioning to marshes along the Albemarle Pimlico Peninsula, shown here. Um, here. <laughs> and uh, I will refer to this as APP. And so I selected five sites around the peninsula, which experienced various levels of salinization and flooding. And so the sites on the northern portion of the APP are um, more fresh. And so they have very low saline levels, about zero to one parts per thousand, uh, while sites on the southern portion tend to be more saline. And so they have uh, salinities as high as maybe 12 parts per thousand. And so these include Swan Quarter and Gull Rock at the bottom. And so um, another site that I have is Pocosin Lakes, which is right in the middle, and this is right next to the Intracoastal Waterway. And so in this peninsula, there's a lot of hydrologic connectivity because of the many canals that are um, that were created, and this is they were created for agriculture purposes to drain some of the wetlands. And so you can see some of the images of my sites. And so the main questions I wanted to ask were, do tree stem greenhouse gas fluxes differ from nearby soils? And if you're not familiar with the term flux, it's just the movement of something flowing out. And so in this case is uh, greenhouse gases from the tree stems to soils. And so the second question, are there differences in tree stem greenhouse gas fluxes across the peninsula? And what are the main drivers of tree stem greenhouse gases? and then which tree stem greenhouse gases contribute more to the radiative balance. As I mentioned before, uh, methane and nitrous oxide are more potent than CO2, even though they are uh, much lower in concentrations. And so the sites were selected because of the abundance of standing dead trees present versus live trees. And here I'm just showing um, the tree density per site. Um, although palmetto pear tree preserve highlighted in red was different in that there were more live trees than, than dead trees, but overall the number of standing dead trees were similar across the sites. And then most of the trees that were selected were pine species, although there were a few bald cypress selected uh, within the Pocosin Lake sites. So this is just a general monitoring setup for, I had for each site. Um, greenhouse gases were measured in two ways, using a gas net, which is a portable gas analyzer, or using a syringe to take samples from the chambers and then bring them back to the lab to be analyzed with a gas chromatograph. And so field campaigns occurred during the growing season, both in 2018 and 2019. And for each site, a minimum of five snags were selected. Uh, tree stem greenhouse gases were measured using this flexible chamber, which was a polycarbonate sheet, and that was wrapped around the tree. And then soil chambers uh, about 30 centimeters in diameter were also installed about one to two meters away from each tree, and fluxes were calculated by uh, greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas concentrations over time. And then weather parameters were measured uh, during sampling using a Kestrel meter. And then during the second field campaign, uh, we installed one well at each site, the second field campaign in 2019. We installed um, one well at each site to monitor water levels and specific conductivity. And in 2019, we also installed three sets of pore water sippers at two depths at 15 and 30 centimeter depth. And at one of the sites at Gull Rock, we also installed 
additional zippers at 40 and 50 centimeters. And so pour water zippers are just made from PVC with tubing attached to a pumice stone at the bottom to extract pour water at that specific depth. Hey, and Melinda, so, oh, yeah. Your sound's a little low. Could you, is there anything you could do to try to talk a little bit louder? Yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I can probably bring the mic closer. Is okay, that better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So in 2019, we also took several soil cores um, to get a better idea on how different soil characteristics were across sites. And so we measured bulk density, um, carbon and nitrogen, nitrogen, and their stable isotopes in water extractable solutes. And just by looking at these soil core images, you can see that palmetto pear tree has uh, a much shallower, shallower um, mineral layer than all the other sites. And once again, I do want to point out that Gull Rock was the only site that had additional pour water zippers. So this information is showing um, pour water solute concentrations. And so um, overall, when looking at the concentrations by depth and site, there were clear differences among sites and general increases in concentration with depths. Sulfate and ammonium were the most different. Uh, sulfate on the left hand side and ammonium that middle graph, the top middle graph. Um, but you can see I highlighted sulfate um, with Gull Rock and Swan Quarter on the right hand side. They're much higher than all the other sites. Um, but Gull Rock, highlighted in red, had significantly higher ammonium than all other sites. And so the variability in pore water uh, concentrations also increased with depth and slightly differed between sites. Um, so here on the left hand side, you have total CO2 uh, concentrations, and the middle is total methane concentrations, and on the right is total nitrous oxide concentrations. And so pore water um, methane differences among sites were kind of the opposite to those sulfate patterns you previously saw. And so the sites with the highest sulfate, which were Gull Rock and Swan Quarter, now have, uh, have, have the lowest pore water methane. And so this occurs because sulfate inhibits methane production. And so there were also no differences in pore water nitrous oxide um, among sites or depths. So one of the biggest differences between the two years of sampling was the amount of precipitation. Here I'm showing the average cumulative precipitation across sites throughout the growing season. And so in 2018, shown in blue, um, this was a much wetter year compared to 2019, which is shown in red, which further affected greenhouse gas fluxes in soils and tree stems. And so here I'm showing the CO2 fluxes for tree stems and soils by year end site. Um, the bolded text indicates significant factors using a two-way ANOVA. And overall, tree stem greenhouse gas fluxes were five to six times less than soil fluxes. And as you can see by the difference in the y-axis between the two, uh, tree stem CO2 fluxes did not differ between years, um, but were different among sites, while CO2 fluxes on the right-hand side um, were different between years and among sites with higher fluxes in 2019 due to the drier conditions. And so following the same format, um, these are the methane fluxes. Tree stem methane fluxes were significantly different by site and year, and there was also a significant interaction effect. And Golrock had much higher tree stem methane in 2018, which then decreased in 2019, while all other sites increased from 2019 to, to 2018 to 2019. <laughs> and then palmetto pear tree tree stem methane was much lower in concentration compared to all other sites. And so soils, uh, soil methane did not differ by year, but uh, it did decrease in variability and had a significant interaction effect. And so lastly, um, these are the nitrous oxide fluxes. Tree stem nitrous oxide fluxes differed by year and site uh, with Gull Rock once again having much higher fluxes and a decrease between 2018 to 2019. Um, all other sites also had a slight decrease in tree stem nitrous oxide. 
And so there was more variability for soils, um, nitrous oxide fluxes between the years and among sites, which made the interaction effect significant. And so I used a Pearson correlation ma matrix to explore some of the relationships between tree stem and soil greenhouse gas fluxes, as well as the correlation between um, gases themselves. And here, um, the strength of the color indicates a stronger correlation, and this data is only for 2019 uh, greenhouse gas fluxes. So here, I just want to walk you kind of through this figure. Um, what I'm highlighting here is the correlation between tree stem CO2 flux and the soil CO2 flux. So they are positively correlated. And this is the same for the tree stem, tree stem methane flux as well as the soil methane flux. And this kind of lets us know that um, the, the positive correlation lets us know that the, the gases that are being emitted from the tree stems are more likely soil produced. And this also occurs is a positive correlation between the tree stem and the soil nitrous oxide flux. And so when I was looking at greenhouse gas relationships within tree stems and soils, um, there is a negative effect, a negative correlation between um, CO2 and methane fluxes within tree stems and soils. So you can see I highlighted the red boxes. <laughs> And this negative correlation also occurs uh, between CO2 and nitrous oxide fluxes. But then when looking at the um, methane and nitrous oxide fluxes, uh, there is a positive correlation in both tree stem and soils. And so um, I created many linear regression models to further determine which environmental factors explain the most variability for each tree stem greenhouse gas. And this was done for only 2019 data. And so I built separate models by environmental group, which are shown at the top, uh, to determine which factors were more impo important. And then I combined the factors um, that were significant, had the highest explanatory power. And so the weather parameters included um, the wind speed, barometric pressure, and temperature. And the water parameters included water level and its deviation, um, specific conductivity and precipitation. And this was done over different ranges, um, looking at what those water parameters were the day of sampling, one day before, two days, three days, and seven days before actually sampling. And so for tree stem CO2 flux, uh, we were able to explain about 21% of the variation with wind speed, which was negatively correlated, specific connectivity, which was also negatively correlated, and water And for tree stem methane fluxes, we're able to explain 83% of the variation. And it was strongly explained by the soil methane flux, which is positively correlated, uh, and specific connectivity, which is also positively correlated, and precipitation, which is negatively correlated. And so the specific connectivity and precipitation correlations are kind of the opposite of what you would think. Um, so it kind of shows this disconnect between soil, what drives soils and tree stem methane fluxes. And so for tree stem nitrous oxide fluxes, we were able to explain about 52% of the variation. Um, and this was explained by soil and nitrous oxide fluxes and positively and then water level deviation, which is positive as well. And when we consider methane and nitrous oxide as CO2 equivalents, because as you may remember, methane and nitrous oxide are more potent than CO2. So we see that after converting to CO2 equivalents, um, CO2 still contributes the most to overall radiative balance in trees and soils. But in 2018, tree stem nitrous oxide contributed just as much as CO2. And so this evidence supports the need to take tree stem greenhouse gas emissions into account at the ecosystem level. And so in conclusion, um, going back to our main questions, do tree stem greenhouse gases differ from soils? Yes, uh, they are much lower than soil greenhouse gas fluxes. Um, do they differ across the sites? Yes, but also the tree stem 
greenhouse gases responded differently to drought by site. And so what are the main drivers of tree stem greenhouse gases? Uh, this differed for each greenhouse gas and for CO2 is largely driven by wind speed and precipitation. And for methane, it was mostly soil methane flux. And for nitrous oxide, for tree stem nitrous oxide, it was largely driven by soil and nitrous oxide. And so lastly, which tree stem greenhouse gas contributes more to radiative balance? It was still mostly CO2, uh, but it also depends on the precipitation. So a dry versus wet year, because in a wet year, the tree stem nitrous oxide fluxes were able to contribute the same amount as uh, CO2 fluxes. And so I guess with that, I'll take any questions. Oops. Okay, thanks, Belinda. Um, if you ha have a question, I don't think there were any questions for Melinda typed into the chat. If you want to unmute yourself and ask the question directly, please go ahead or go ahead and use the chat and I can relay it to Melinda. And Anna has posted the uh, feedback evaluation in the chat, so you can also take a few minutes to do that before you leave. Uh, it's Kurt Richardson. <clears throat> I have a quick question. What were the units for the um, uh, methane production per unit area? Were they in nanograms or? or so it's they milligrams, milligrams per meter square per hour. Do you mean the, um, hold on, let me go back. It seems quite high, but maybe I'm remembering those wrong, but. Yeah, milligrams per meter square per hour. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's a, it seems a bit high, but that's from what we've measured, but um, you know, it is whatever you've measured. No, yeah, when I compare it to other studies, this is actually along the same lines as other studies. Um, and actually in places like the Amazon basin, they recorded tree stem methane to be as high as like 60 milligrams per meter square per hour. Right, I was just as concerned about the soil ones. I didn't realize soils were quite that high. Well, these are also, I mean, like in wetlands, they're, they can be pretty high. Okay. All right, here's a question for you. If the trees were harvested and removed before the marsh converts, would that limit the ability of the greenhouse gas to be emitted or with retention in the soil itself. If they're harvested before? Right, yep. if they're harvested before the... Um, well, I guess you'd be removing um, all three gases, but I don't know. So because they're still intact, they are emitting something, but it's still not as much as soils. So I guess the take home here is that they, they need to be taken into account so soils are still the largest contributor for all three gases. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay. Um, what would be the result of harvesting um, some of the snags? Would that change the emissions or retention factors? Um, yeah, I mean, you'd be making way for, I guess you'd be easing the transition from forest to marsh, but it's kind of hard to say because these are, even though they're transitioning and they are acting as straws, these are also like new habitats um, for certain species. And so you just kind of have to go with it. And so I guess, I don't know if harvesting would be the best. Uh, John Hoban, you asked a question that says tree um, N2O versus soil N2O. Uh, do you want to elaborate on your question? Yeah, could we go, I think it's one or two slides forward where you had the bar graph and we were able to look at a number of the greenhouse gases. Um, and it was just striking to me how much more nitrous oxide. Yeah, here we are. Um, yeah, I, 
I guess I, I wouldn't have. I thought maybe that the overall equivalence might be similar, but this is pretty striking for nitrous oxide to me. Um, I don't I don't know what might be at work there at play. I, I have not thought much about tree stem uh, greenhouse gas fluxes though. Um, yeah, this is. I feel like there's more recent studies coming out. I mean, a lot of I think tree stem gas emissions have been measured since the 70s, but it hasn't been a very popular subject, and it's now being considered. Um, more important as an additional pathway to help kind of close some of these um, uncertainties in budgets, in greenhouse gas budgets. And so, yeah, like I was actually shocked to um, how in 2018 tree stem nitrous oxide fluxes can contribute, you know, just as much as the CO2, um, but it varies because in 2019 it was much drier and so that greatly affected a lot. Sure, but just um, that single year, I wonder how many years uh, look more like 2018. Um, how average of a response that might be. Yeah, I'm not sure I would need more repeated measurements. Yeah, really interesting result, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you still collecting data right now? Or is this a two-year study? Um, I'm only collecting uh, data from one other site, which was not mentioned here, but I'm done with these sites. Um, so here's two questions for you. Why do you think greenhouse gas emissions were negatively correlated with wind speed? Yeah, I was still trying to figure that out myself. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Negatively, yeah. If anybody has any ideas, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I had, and then I guess the last question is from um, Dr. Richardson. Was there a level below which your methane was reduced? Was there a, was, I'm sorry, was there a water level below which methane was reduced? Did you have a threshold amount value? For what do you mean? Was there a water level below which method? Kurt, do you want to? Uh, what I'm wondering is <clears throat> we have <clears throat> found that if you kept the water level below the surface, say um, below, say, 10 or 15 centimeters, then uh, you get a certain amount of methane versus if you keep it at five centimeters or above. So you were looking at different water levels, and I'm just wondering if you happen to know when you would get more or less methane at any particular water level? Yeah, for the soil fluxes, um, for 2019, the water level was much lower than 2018, so it was reduced. Um, but that didn't necessarily affect the tree stems. In fact, it was actually higher, and I think it's because um, for the tree stems, the roots are still intact, and so they're, at, they're um, getting methane from deeper soils. Yeah, deeper depths, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, we'll do one last question. It said, what happens with the tree stem emissions once the land around the trees are inundated with water? What happens to whenever they're inundated? Um, so when well, eventually water, these yeah. tree stems yeah, fall over. Like they don't last, I mean, they do last a while, um, but Every once in a while, whenever you get a hurricane, you just get knocked over, or if you get knocked over and slows down decomposition, and then it kind of becomes part of the soil. But greenhouse gases from the soils can still be um, diffused through the water column, um, either through bubbling, because you get like uh, an overabundance of greenhouse gases, and then they just kind of bubble out to the atmosphere, or it can just slowly diffuse. Um, do that water column. So eventually, I'm, I mean, they'll be more likely, if it's inundated, it will be more likely that there will be higher methane production. 
Well, great job on the study. There was one or two more questions that came in, uh, Melinda, that you can look at after this and can get back in touch with the people that asked them. But we're at the end of our time, so I want to thank you and all of our speakers today and WRI for hosting this virtual session. Anna, do you want to have any closing words? Thank you so much, Kim. I will just wrap it up quickly. I'll say thank you to our audience. Thank you to our moderator, Kim, and Carolina Wetlands for sponsoring overall. We appreciate your support. Um, thank you to Mike and Brock and Melinda. I know you guys put a lot of effort into getting up, getting dressed, and putting on your expert hats this morning. So we certainly appreciate it. And again, this recorded session will be posted within a few days on our conference website. We will also follow up um, with uh, that recording and uh, also the evaluation to everyone once again. So thank you for your time today and we'll, we're planning a third session already. So get ready, uh, coming in June, hopefully. We will have that ready to go. So take care everybody, thank you.